increase and multiply upon us your mercy, that with you as our ruler and guide, we may so pass through things temporal that we lose not the things eternal. Pass through things temporal, meaning here, our lives on earth, what we encounter every day, the good, the not so good, the joyful, the sad, that we lose not the things eternal, experiencing in all things your love for us and the ability to show love to, other word, to others. In other words, the kingdom. That's what it's really about today, isn't it? The kingdom. We hear more parables in Matthew's gospel, our third week in a row of hearing them. And again, they're not about us or about the church, but about the kingdom. The kingdom that is coming, but also the kingdom here, now, if we are willing to see it and to live into it. But more than that, it's about the unexpected. That in the kingdom, even as we live in things temporal, we can experience the eternal in ways we never knew possible. It's not always what we anticipated, what we expect, it's more. More parables. Again, chapter 13 is the section of Matthew's Gospel that contains all of these parables and we have been hearing them a little bit out of order as we've gone through them over the past three Sundays counting today. Remember last week Jesus talked about the wheat and the weeds or the wheat and the tares as it's sometimes called. And then after that he went back to the house and the disciples followed him and asked about it. But before this happens, before Jesus goes back to the house for the disciples to ask about it, he tells the crowds the parables of the mustard seed and yeast. What we heard today, part of what we heard today. So he tells the crowds, the mustard seed, the yeast, then he tells about the wheat and the weeds, then he goes back to the house, and then he tells three more parables just to the disciples, and that would be the parables of the treasure, the pearl, and the fish, which we also heard today. And then he asks them a question. So again, things are a little out of order, but I want you to hear that some of this is to the crowd, some of this is just to the disciples, a lot of parables at once. But we start today with the mustard seed, and I think that of all the parables is probably the one that we might say we know the best. Not that there's a whole lot to say to explain that parable, and I think we all understand it. The smallest seed becomes the largest shrub. And I don't know how a shrub becomes a tree, but Jesus said it happens, so we'll believe it. The small becomes big. It's not what you expect, right? And then the yeast, the same thing. We're told that the woman takes a small amount of yeast and mixes it with three measures of flour, which doesn't sound like a whole lot. But again, you have to understand that a measure of flour is large enough to make bread for about 150 people. So three measures of flour is a pretty significant amount of flour and the point that just a little bit of yeast goes a long way to leaven the whole thing. And if you read anything about mustard, I don't know what to call them, mustard shrubs, mustard bushes when you see them out in the wild, apparently once you plant them, they never stop. They continue to grow over and over, which even then emphasizes Jesus' point, right? The smallest seed becomes this massive thing. And Jesus talks to the disciples, the treasure and pearl. Again, it's about the kingdom. And wouldn't you, if you found the kingdom, whether it's that treasure in the field or that pearl of great value, wouldn't you sell everything you had to have that? Wouldn't you want that in your life at all times? And the fish, the story of the fish, reminds us again of the story of the wheat and the weeds where the good is separated from the bad. And they sit down and they put the good in baskets and the bad goes out to that outer darkness, to that place where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. Again, one of Matthew's fra favorite phrases. I'll say more about that in a minute. 
And then the disciples in the house are gathered and Jesus asks them a question. Have you understood all this? To which they say, yes. And if you've heard me preach on this before, you hear me say this every time, I really wish they would have said no because I want to hear what Jesus would say. I want to hear Jesus say more about it, but they said yes, which kind of ended the conversation. And one of the parts that was left out of this whole sequence over the last few weeks, and I talked about a little bit last week, is that the disciples asked Jesus, why do you speak to the crowds in parables? This was after he told the first parable of the sower. And Jesus tells them that they have been chosen, the disciples, to hear what others cannot hear and see what others cannot see. He says, many prophets and righteous people long to see what you see and to hear what you hear, but didn't. Specifically, the scribes and the Pharisees and those people who think they know everything Jesus concludes this section by asking them if they have understood all this, and they say yes. And then Jesus adds this last parable of the master of the household and says, Therefore every scribe who has been trained for the kingdom of heaven, that's you, disciples, and hopefully us to some extent, is like the master of a household who brings out of his treasure what is old and what is new. The Pharisees and those like them only bring what they have been taught, the old. But you have seen something new in what I, Jesus, bring. You still have the old and can teach from it, but now you have the new as well. And you need to teach my ways and to love as I have loved you. And in teaching my ways, you bring the two together. The kingdom comes. Not what we expected, but so much more. We hear it in the reading about Solomon today. God asks Solomon what he wants, and Solomon gives an answer we don't expect. He doesn't ask for riches and long life and things like that. He asks for wisdom. I'm a young man. God, help me to discern what is right for these people that you have given me. It's not what was expected. And we're told that God is pleased and grants Solomon that wisdom. But what we don't read is the next part that says, and God said, even though you didn't ask for it, I'm going to give you everything else as well. The riches and the long life, etc., etc. Even Paul sees the unexpected in what living our lives to Christ can do. He emphasizes the passing through things temporal, hardship, distress, persecution, one of Paul's famous lists, but loses not the things eternal, the love of God in Christ Jesus. And he says those words, which I hope we always remember, that nothing can separate us from that love. No hardship or ruler or government or anything, nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. And if we are willing, we can see the kingdom all around us when we share the love of God in Christ Jesus. And we see it here for sure when we gather like this to worship. I saw it yesterday at the deanery picnic as we gathered with others from around the northwest metro part of the diocese to share with one another and, and to eat a meal together. And we even got something we didn't expect yesterday, rain. It was forecast to be over 100 degrees yesterday, which I'm sure scared some people away. Exactly not what you want for a picnic. But the rain came and cooled it off to a comfortable, tolerable temperature. Not what we expected, but we got so much more. One of the ways in which I have experienced the kingdom in my life. I've talked about this before, and if you've heard me talk about it, I apologize that you're going to hear it again. It was when I was in the Diocese of Alabama, and every summer I would serve as a session director at summer camp, uh, known as Camp McDowell, the diocesan camp. And as the, uh, not the session director, the program director, 
a priest would come in and direct the program that would be done every day with the kids. And so I did that for seven years in a row, seven summers in a row. And I did Midler Camp, which was rising fifth and sixth graders, 10, 11, 12 years old, lots of energy, lots of questions, but still an age where they kind of will listen to you when you talk to them. So I liked that age. It was always hot that time of year in July at camp. And I would do a different program every year. And what I learned after the third year was that I don't have to reinvent the wheel. And these kids grow and age out of my camp so I can repeat the programs after a while. But one of the ones I did that I particularly liked was a program called Be Still and Know That I Am God. And it was a more contemplative thing. And I wasn't sure it would work with fifth and sixth graders, but amazingly, it did. Not what I expected, but what we got was so much more. And we talked about stories. My habit was in the program time to read through these stories in the Bible and then have the kids act them out so they felt like they were living into what we were talking about and maybe would understand it a little better. And talked about those times where we hear God in places we don't expect to hear God. It's not always in the noise and the loudness, but in the, the quiet spaces. And we talked about Elijah going up the mountain and God not in the earthquake and the fire and the thunder and all that, but in the silence. And we talked about hearing the voice of God, but not understanding it was God's voice. In the case of uh, Samuel, uh, as a young boy with the priest Eli, and Samuel thinks it's Eli calling him, but Eli says, no, it's God, listen to what God says. And then when God talks to you, but you don't always want to hear what God has to say, as in the case of Jonah, who runs away, but eventually does what God asks. And then we talked about Jesus, whose time was in prayer. We're often told Jesus would go off by himself to pray, and that's when he had that time. So we did these stories. We talked about it, and the kids would break up into small groups uh, with one of the counselors. And I had a series of questions that they would answer wasn't very sure how they would respond to these questions. I asked things like, you know, where have you heard God talk to you in your life? Uh, where have you heard God, not in the noise, but in the, in the quiet silence? And the kids, amazingly, actually answered these questions. And I didn't get to sit in on all the groups, but the counselors would come back and tell me, we didn't think they would be able to handle these questions, but man, did they talk and talk and talk. I'm like, that's great, that's awesome. And then we, would, uh, we talked about prayer, and I had them all in their small group write a prayer. And then at the closing Eucharist, when all the parents were there, I had them get up and read their prayer so I could say, see, parents, they learned something while they were here. And it was beautiful. It was the kingdom right in front of us. But there was one experience when I had done this program, one particular year, I was... Uh, this, the camp was about five days, and this particular year, a Sunday was one of those days, so we did a Eucharist for everyone there. And the gospel we had was what we heard last week, Matthew's account of the wheat and the weeds. And at the end of that gospel, when he, when he says, uh, the weeds will be collected and burned and thrown into the outer darkness where there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And I was telling the, the campers there, you know, don't be worried by that phrase, weeping and gnashing of teeth in the outer darkness. It, it, it's not like, you know, you're going to go there. I mean, d that there's a real place where that could happen and you see people gnashing their teeth. I don't know what that would look like, but it probably wouldn't be pretty. I said, but it's, it's, a, it's a warning to us to, to not be without God. And I said that outer darkness represents the absence of God and not be in your life. And don't don't be in that place. Be in the light. Be in the light where uh, Jesus wants you to be. And as I'm saying these things, I'm thinking in my head, I didn't think through this enough to know how I'm going to end this sermon. And I'm saying this, and I'm like, I don't know what to do to conclude this. That does happen sometimes. And all of a sudden, one of the little girls, campers, raises her hand. And I thought, someone's asking a question in the middle of a sermon. Okay. So I said, yes. And she said, what about when you have to turn the light off in your room to go to sleep? When your cabin counselor says, it's time for bed, you gotta turn the lights off. 
you're in the darkness, what do we do then? And I thought, oh my goodness, that's a great question. And I said, it's not about the physical act of turning lights off. It's about that, that darkness where God isn't, isn't there, where you have shut God out. But you don't have to worry about that in your own life because you already have the light that Jesus has put there. That light that's in your heart that's already there, that's the light we don't want to be shut off. You can turn the lights off in your house. That's, that's the temporal. But the eternal is the light that always shines within you. And she seemed satisfied by that answer. I found a nice way to wrap up my sermon. So it seemed like a good win for everybody. And after the service, one of the adults on staff came to me and said, did you plant that girl there to ask that question? And I said, no but I wish she would come back to my church every Sunday and ask questions during the sermon. But the point was, even through her, her innocence and wonder, you could see the kingdom. These kids are at an age where they weren't jaded yet by the things of the world, those temporal things that we all deal with day in and day out. They still have that raw, amazement and trust and that understanding that that love of God is there in Christ Jesus that love that can never that we can never be separated from and that that light continues to shine and the kingdom continues to unfold the small things become large the things we don't understand begin to make sense in light of that kingdom and the things we don't always expect are what happens and not just what happens but even more